Hello, this is International Master and author John Watson. Welcome to Beyond the Opening. This is a show that explains positional ideas with a particular emphasis on pawn structures that recur throughout chess practice. Although I will also be covering things beyond simply structural issues, but that's the sort of the basis, that's the the bedrock of these lectures. So that's one way to look at it. Most of positional chess is in some sense related to pawn structures. This will be my 15th lecture on isolated pawns and their relatives, and will be my last one for a while on that subject, although there is certainly enough subject matter in this subject for a few hundred lectures. To review, we first covered pure isolated queen pawn positions, then isolated pawn couples, then hanging pawns, then the ram structure, then an advanced isolated pawn, which was not a passed pawn. And then we looked at the isolated C pawns, uh, did a few of those. And in the last two lecture, lectures, we're looking at the isolated E pawn. Then we'll be done with isolated pawns, as I said before. Uh, I'm going to split I, these, this isolated E pawn subject into two lectures. Last week, I looked at isolated E pawns for white. And this week, I'm going to look at isolated E pawns for black. So without further ado, let's move on to the examples. What you have before you is a game segment. You can see there was sort of a King's Indian kind of structure. And we find that that's probably the most common example of an isolated black E pawn. So let's just continue. Now white attacks f5 three times. And so black has to do something. Well, what black does is he moves out of the way with the idea of using a pin to protect it, like that. And he wants to take back that. And if given the choice, he might take back with the pawn to have two nice hanging pawns there, but ones that are uh, quite mobile. Uh, instead, white messes up his plan by changing the structure. And let's play a few moves here. Now notice that black's coming to that beautiful square there. And white is coming to that beautiful square there. Now let's just talk about this for a second. That's an outpost in front of an isolated pawn. We've talked about that. It's in front of the isolated E pawn, which is a central pawn, which means that its reach that knight's reach is going to be very, very nice because it's in the center, which means it has even more influence than an outpost often will. In fact, similar to the reach that a outpost uh, knight uh, had against an isolated D pawn, because that's a central pawn too. So you can see we have that one arrow is not very good, is it? So you can see we have a, a strong reach there. Now black is going to get this outpost here. But the one difference is that there's no isolated pawn that he's blockading or is able to attack. This pawn on e5 is attacked. And another huge difference here is look how bad that bishop is on g7. And one reason it's bad is because this pawn can't advance. It's firmly blockaded. So that bishop is a, is a big problem. OK, well, let's just keep moving here. Black moves out of the way. White gets out of the way of the, um, the f file. And white aggressively looks at e6, the e6 square. And now white tries to exchange queens. This is a very good idea because it clarifies white's advantage. And in fact, the e pawn can't even be held very long because it's that weak. In spite of being defended by the bad bishop, white's able to get to it. And as we talked about with isolated pawns, sometimes you just win them. OK, and now white has some control there. Uh, possibly he's going to sink in there. And if it's exchanged, that knight's not going to have a good place to go to. And he has a many-way attack on that pawn. And that's the key. So it's that simple. But I want, just wanted to show the basic blockading characteristic. So we'll keep going here. He could, in fact, take that pawn right now. 
but he wants to get rid of that g7 bishop, the one that's so bad. Why does he want to do that? Well, it's a protector of this pawn. More importantly, if that pawn were taken, that bishop would suddenly have a free diagonal. So white's going to get rid of it before taking the pawn. He does so. Actually, it was easier here, I should say, just for the record, if you're looking at this game and wondering what's going on, that this was an easier way to do it, to win the pawn. Uh, as it turns out, this has some complications playing the way he did, taking that way. But they aren't complications that in the end disturb anything. It's still a winning position for white. Okay, you can see things are going off now. Very nice bishop on h2. Solid pass, pawn, pass d pawn, and really the rest is just technique. And I think this time that phrase is not deceptive in the sense that it really is pretty easy for a change. Okay, and Black's, <laughs> actually Black sets up a nice blockade of this pawn, but of course it's much too late. And he defends that C pawn. Black can't stray very far because of the pass to D pawn, and in fact at this point uh, Black resigns. And you can look at that if you want to, but you'll see that it's quite easy at this point, and look at this ridiculous night over here. Real real trouble over there. Okay, so let's move on to another game, but that just sort of shows the basic idea, the isolated e-pawn blockaded, and how even though the opponent had a wonderful outpost, he didn't have a target to, to pile up against. So the knight on d4 didn't really do that much in comparison with the knight on e4. And uh, generally that bad bishop was also worth thinking about because it couldn't create activity so, let's just move on to another game here. Okay, this game, we'll just start this one out from the beginning. So you can see how it came up, not that important. It's going to be another King's Indian structure. Actually a Peart's defense by transposition, but it's the same structure. Black is playing for f5. White may or may not play for c5. You'll see what happens here. And in fact, this is kind of a fascinating structure that is the basis of a lot of King's Indian theory. What happens, well, let's just get some more pieces out. What it amounts to is the question of what happens when white doesn't play for c5, but plays for f4. There we go. This structure is actually sort of fundamental. It's one that white usually doesn't play in the King's Indian. He doesn't play it because it doesn't work that well. <laughs> so that's why you don't see it that often. Once in a while it does work, and it's essential to saying why black doesn't play certain move orders. But often in this kind of position, the first player to exchange a pawn will get the worst game. So you have to prepare very carefully before you exchange pawns. Um, just for example, if he starts exchanging that pawn, that rook starts coming right down that file against the queen, but also into weak squares. And if he takes that pawn, the knight comes to that beautiful square in the middle of the board. Likewise, with white, if he starts taking that pawn, he can give up a nice outpost here. If he starts taking that pawn, he can allow a uh, possibly a pass, protected pass pawn with e4. However, we'll see that that last exchange has its advantages as well, but only really because of this move, which even intuitively looks kind of wrong. He wants to get the rooks out, the queen rook out, but what that means, of course, is that he's got one fewer piece on the king side, protecting his pawn structure. White attacks that knight there. Black defends it, and white goes exchanges. Now that exchange is more valuable because this bishop wasn't here, either to recapture it or to protect this. So that pawn's a little bit vulnerable. And white plays here, sort of indirectly attacking that point. Black sort of covers that diagonal. And you notice here, let me just quickly say, if this move, you get sort of a standard structure here, worth taking a quick peek at, just because we're talking about pawn structures in general. And the problem now is that this knight can come in and hit that very important square, and by the way, hit that weak pawn. We're also attacking the knight here. So really, black would have to take that, and then if you look at it, you have this unopposed, wonderful bishop coming down into those squares, and that's almost always a very strong thing. And uh, even to go just slightly further, one thing that's going to happen here soon, I'm not going to maybe make exact moves, but one thing that's going to happen soon here is that white's going to end up playing 
to E3 with that ideal outpost that Nimzovich talked about so much in front of the protected pass bond, which is going to extend to all kinds of things. He might even have a G4 break, and he's able to attack the F5 square, and he's completely stopped the E4 protected pass bond from moving. Finally, very much like last game, look at that bishop stuck behind its central pawn. That's a very or something that's supporting the central pawn. At any rate, it has no scope, and that's almost the worst thing of all about this position. So let's just keep moving in this game. And what we get, let's go back to where we were. There we are. Black instead plays this move, and white simply takes it. Now it seems funny to give up that bishop for a knight, especially since that knight wasn't really doing much. But the idea is this. It takes again. Now if the bishop takes it, guess what? We've given up that wonderful square again. And that's going to be big trouble. Also this notice that that pawn's attacked. So there are even some tactical issues here. But white's on f5 and e6. It's really not an acceptable result. And in fact, if he takes this way, we get exactly the same thing knight here. Maybe there's some discovered attacks, but in any case this would be good enough. So what's left, actually I think there's even better here, which is just to take this. Probably be a little better way to do that. And then actually just put the bishop here. It turns out that's particularly strong uh, because he can, for example, simply take this and then play knight e4 and the king's way too exposed. This knight can go here or here, the queen's still here, and you've got two files for the rook to fiddle around on. So, in the game, black was forced to play that move, and what does that do? That sets up that position. The blockader, the ideal blockader of the knight in front of the isolated pawn and the bad bishop. Very easy for things like this to happen. In that case, it happened almost by force because the exchanges were pretty much compulsory on black's part. So this blockader will dominate the play, and the black pawn on e5 is permanently weak. A um, few more moves here. White, of course, is happy to simplify. You can get very, very simple in a position like this. And in fact, that's what white does, because the minor pieces by themselves will win. Now he'd like to get the queens off, too. That would be nice. A couple extra moves. Keeps a knight out of uh, b5, which is always handy. Okay, he's liquidating here. Uh, the, the knight, the pawn is pinned to the knight, so that's going to get something off the board. He defends it. Only way to defend this square. White might be able to do some other things here, but he plays it very straightforwardly. Expands on the queen side, and then when the time comes, he takes the queens off. Remember I said that minor pieces could win by themselves. Now, interestingly, this bishop isn't really that bad, right? It now has a diagonal. Often you do that in the king's Indian to bring it back here. And in other openings, by the way. Um, in fact, there are all those cute little openings where you play like that to get to a diagonal. Um, so, what was I going to say? I was going to say that this position, you've still got the blockader, still got the weak pawn, have a very good bishop here. Uh, so the two the knights are actually better than black's bishops, and, and white's remaining bishop is good. So his plan is simply to break through. Let's see how he wins this. Um, I should mention... Yeah, there were, there were earlier moves. I think I'll just skip those. There were earlier ways for white to get c5 in, which would have been maybe a little faster than this. But that's still his plan. His plan is to get here, create some pass pawns, support them, and push them forward, and really push a pass pawn home. Also, cramp black is another point. So let's see how he does this. Okay, there's more pieces coming off. White doesn't mind. There it goes. The pawns are moving. Good way to take because it threatens bishop takes uh, f8. It's an outpost. Look at these pawns. Three, four, four isolated pawns. Really, the only one that really counts are the ones on the queen side. Couldn't take that because the c7 pawn would have fallen. So you see white's just gaining space. Black's making really necessary moves. So that's the breakthrough. That breakthrough is works tactically, basically. Threatens, of course, to... Uh, to capture. If black had taken this pawn, if nothing else would have fallen. You can check that out yourself. Check. This is what saves the pawn. And at this point, the king starts coming in. And really, I don't think there's much to look at here in terms of variations. White's just going to walk his pawns in. 
as follows. Now he's on the e-pawn too. So I think he resigns here. Um, no, he plays there. Obviously the king can walk in now through all these squares and just march home. Now he resigns. Okay, so what did we learn from that? Basically the same thing as in the game before. I wanted to emphasize it. Just as black, we really emphasize this control of the square e5. Uh, in this, against the backward e-pawn on e4, we're doing exactly the same thing here. We're emphasizing the square e4 against the backward pawn on e5. And it's interesting that those e-pawn openings tended to come from the Sicilian, and these are coming from the King's Indian, or at least a King's Indian kind of structure, in this case the Peart's, but the same basic idea. So let's just move on to another game. Okay, this is a slightly more complicated example. White just exchanged queens, and uh, so let me have white recapture. White has more space. Black has two basic disadvantages. No, notice he doesn't have any isolated e-pawn yet. Uh, his basic disadvantage, one, is obvious. This bishop is simply bad, as often in the King's Indian. And it has to find a way to get out. It's you know, black's favorite piece, but it's also black's curse in many ways. And the other thing is that this knight here is a particular problem piece. It doesn't really have anywhere to go. Notice that it's just sort of cut off in every forward direction by White's pawns or his own pawns. So that's that's an issue. Except for that, really, there's nothing much special, that no special advantages that White has, but that turns out to be probably enough. So Black gets some pieces off, but as we saw last game, it doesn't always help to simplify. Three minor pieces are plenty to win a game like this. So we're in a very similar thing. Now notice that Black's knight also didn't have any forward squares to go to. So it goes back to where it can do some good. Excuse me. And white comes back. Now this is interesting because in some ways, you know, black has no weaknesses. These are all, well, there's, there's interior weaknesses, but there's no pawn weaknesses. The pawns are all protected and in a row. And in fact, you could argue that white's pawn here is the only one that's really weak. This pawn is theoretically a little weak. But the pawn in e4 is really the only, white has the only weakness, which is kind of ironic. But we still, of course, have the difficulty of this bishop and the fact that white has more space. So now knight b5 is going to be an issue at some point, And black stops that move. Unclear if that's the best move. But white centralizes. It's not clear what his plan is. And there is a key, key move. It turns out to be a big mistake. He should just sit on the position. And that's awfully hard to win for white. It may be one, but it's not so easy. And that's why it's a mistake. Now, in the King's Indian and similar structures, you almost always see this move. That's the way you take. It opens up the queen side. And more importantly, it blocks this pawn. Now, of course, there are plenty of times when you do take this way, but especially when we get towards an endgame. But the point is, is that you don't want to take that way in general, because when this pawn moves, that frees this pawn. And when that pawn moves, the main problem piece gets out. In fact, often becomes a strong piece. But of course, in this exact position, there's that problem. He'll simply drop the pawn, which you certainly can't afford to do. That'll be even attacked afterwards. That white will win easily. So because of that, it's not a problem. Black plays another move, covers this. So this square could be important for a bishop or a knight. And white covers that e4 square. So in fact, taking with the e-pawn didn't really hurt. And in fact, it gives you a little more chance of getting a passed pawn over there. So white is simply taking over that square. Not, not yet in front of an isolated pawn, but it's certainly a great outpost. OK, we're down to two minor pieces. And OK, the break. So now here he is trying to make past pawns. And black plays a funny move. Now there's not much to do here. Black's, uh, white's starting to break through. So black plays a little trick. That looks terrible, right? Making his pawns more mobile. And, and why wouldn't he just move over to defend? We should maybe take a quick look at that. Basically, the king comes up to beautiful squares on c4, for example. But first, he does something that we've emphasized a lot in these lectures. I don't know if you can guess what's going on here. But you know, this is the bad bishop. Knight's not so thrilling either. And what do you do when you have black tied down like this, where black can hardly move? He says it's very difficult for him to move his piece. He only has a few that are even slightly mobile. So what does white play? He opens up a second front. We've talked about this a lot. 
and as always captures more space and space by itself at this point on both sides of the board is going to win this is just an example but now you could probably even play there's various moves you could do to win even more space but in the example I'm going to show <laughs> he sort of plays the most pure kind of space game which is to play b5 now threatening c6 check so and then well, actually, he doesn't stop. If he plays uh, pawn takes, there's knight takes, and this is loose. All kinds of things are loose, so he tries this move to sort of blockade, but that doesn't really work. And one reason that doesn't work is because there's still another side of the board over here. Goes there. Now, he can't afford to open that up. So he takes, and now it's almost locked, but not quite. And now there's the threat of knight e8 check. And unfortunately, that allows knight c7 check stall move here threatening this and guess what six long this bishop has absolutely nowhere to go these knights can't move without that knight can't move without giving up b6 the bishop has to go here knight comes down here and he wipes out this pawn later he'll wipe out that two pass pawns and he'll win so very nice very nice little example of how the blockade uh, and the advance of the pawns succeeded now you'll notice we haven't really looked at an isolated pawn yet so black plays a little trick here which is that he realizes that even though those pawns look more mobile now they could actually be blockaded for example here and that's not easy to win at all that's a very nice blockade a lot of squares covered uh, so even though there's this isolated pawn here it's not that easy to win uh, the king can settle in comfortably on that square so that would be a mistake and instead white plays what I'm sure he wanted to do anyway and they trade pawns and white has this extra pass pawn but more importantly he probably couldn't win this game if it wasn't for the fact that that's an isolated pawn now an isolated e pawn and guess what there's this wonderful square in front of it for pieces uh, in this case the king also the knight can go there so we suddenly have a very simple case of the isolated e pawn which is weak and imprisons this bishop we have Finally, the e-pawn starts it in. That cuts off the king, notice. White checks. And, of course, black has a real problem here. Let me just look at what happens if he doesn't play king e8, by the way. If he doesn't play king e8 here, which turns out to be sort of desperation. He can play here trying to blockade the pawn, but then the king starts coming in. And now king e8 is better because it gives him a square to go to, and there's no c6, which keeps the, cuts the king off. But... What happens is after this check, and down here, we're threatening that and that, which is plenty. We'll just finish that off for a second. Check here. Now, this bishop is free, but he's a clear pawn up now, which is sort of ruins the whole idea. One more move, because this knight is pinned, but now it's not pinned anymore. So why will we win with his extra pawn? So that was just a deviation there to show why black did play king e8. And king e8, of course, has this problem that he can't get any further over. And the knight wasn't able to reorganize. So this game is over in just a second here. In fact, he resigns now. Why does he resign? Because he'd love to come this way to try and blockade. But then we have the very cute two-move checkmate, which is kind of cute. And if he goes the other way, he's too far away from the pawn. Uh, for example, if he goes this way, you can just march the pawn in. Um, so that game, again, simply showed the isolated e-pawn. But before that, I, I showed the general advance with the blockading knight on e4 and how to translate that into a position where you, you can still stop that bishop from moving, but at some point you get some sort of majority. And how did you do that? You just kept increasing your space advantage. And in, one that, in that one very nice example, that is, white turned to the king's side to block black's position completely and then pushed all his queen side pawns and simply won by preponderance of space and keeping this bishop a bad piece. Okay, that brings us to one more game. So what we've seen here is that the isolated e-pawn from black's point of view or white's point of view really isn't very different. They just come from different openings. And once again in this game, we're going to see another King's Indian. Interesting that originally I sort of underestimated the number of isolated e-pawns black could possibly have until I realized that he got them constantly out of this structure. 
and obviously it's a very important structure in chess. Okay, in this case, uh, white's advancing, so the opening's a little different. And black attacks that pawn three times, and it advances. And guess what we've created here? Doubled, this time doubled, isolated e-pawns. Of course, black's also a pawn ahead. So white castles, no, he can't move the knight yet, like that or something, because this guy's hanging. So white castles. And now he's got a problem with this knight g5 move, attacking the knight and the pawn. So he plays that move, which really is not ideal. It turns out that in this position, really because black's a pawn ahead, and it does actually mean something, that that's probably the best move. And in fact, I actually had black twice in this position. I drew a grandmaster and also a strong master. And uh, it's quite playable for a variety of reasons. But one, one, one reason right off the bat is that you're covering that very important square. The other reason is that you can come around and get a nice outpost for yourself. Some piece is going to end up on that weak square d4, which is the king's Indian, the vulnerable square in the king's Indian from the very beginning, actually. If you think about it, all the ways that you attack the king's Indian involve the d4 square, c5, d5, knight c6. So after that terrific aside, let's see what really happened. What really happened is he brought the wrong knight back, although it might not have been completely disastrous. And white attacked this pawn. Black defended and got really two nice, nice looking squares where they hit d3. It just turned out that there are ways for white to get a good game here. The simplest one is this. Maybe not the best actually, but that's what he played. And it does work, so I guess we can't argue about it. It doesn't work quite as well. Okay, now he's hitting this and getting his pieces out quickly. So black plays there. The problem is if black plays a move like this, as you can imagine, um, White's going to do something really quickly, probably, and now pretty soon he's going to split those pawns like that. And what happens here? Here he has a blockader in front of the two isolated e-pawns, and he's attacking this pawn. So even though he, he's a pawn ahead, this is an interesting position because black has two pairs of isolated doubled pawns and five isolated ones in total. But strange to say, he can play this position. He only has really a modest disadvantage because of his bishop pair and the fact that he does control central squares like d4. Nevertheless, white stands better. So let's just go back and see what actually happened. The knight just retreated instead. And white decided to get rid of rooks. And black got his last piece out. This turns out to be a bad move. He should just sort of move to the side because he can't really. He really doesn't want to get those rooks off and see the uh, d file. So, and if if something like that happened, White would simply play either a move like knight b5, or because that hits also a7, or a simple move like this, simply blockading the pawns as we discussed. And this would be pretty tough. Even a move like c5 might happen, freeing this bishop is only bad piece. But it's it's a game. It's possible to play this way. Uh, as it turns out, he plays here, which is much more logical. Get that last piece out, maybe he can go to c6. Makes a lot of sense, but it has a tactical problem, essentially a tactical problem, which is this. Where is the knight going to go? If it goes back here, he's stuck with that position. That's not what he wants, although it may be almost as good as what he did. Actually, it's, it's quite bad because there's this problem of playing uh, rook here and bishop here, which makes it even worse than it looks like. Um, so what happens is, instead, black plays this retreat, and white attacks that anyway. And you might think, well, it's not that bad because I got rid of one of the attackers, but the problem is this very, very simple tactic. Rook takes, rook takes, bishop e6 winning the rook is actually very hard to meet because if the king moves over, you have this problem of the rook just coming in and grabbing some more pawns, and, well, you can see, and the knight can't go anywhere, and White's going to probably clean up here pretty quickly. So Black tries something else. He simply puts the bishop out, but that gives him this huge square, and you'll see what happens here in a second. Okay, <laughs> so now 7th rank rook, and that pawn's hanging. <clears throat> Turns out it's very hard to stop that. This knight is also in terrible shape, because he can't really get anywhere without losing other pawns. So Black tries this move, which is actually sort of a blunder. He probably should play something like rook e8 and just protect this pawn. But then after that move, all kinds of trouble here. All kinds of things attacked. So 
that's probably best. I'm not absolutely sure of that, but you can look at it yourself. Uh, what happens instead is this, which turns out to be a blunder. It looks really nice. Why not? You can get rid of that bishop and see what you can do. I mean, at least black's very active in this position. The problem is white has that move, which black had thought was bad because of this. You know, winning a piece, right, or doing something good. But the problem is white has that nice move, attacking the rook. And you might think, well, what's that? Except that that's a checkmate. So I think they played a few more moves, but the problem is the rook on d6 is getting lost here. So he has to give it up, and he's got white has an extra pawn and an exchange. Just a couple more moves here. White starts advancing to keep the knight out of play still. Brings all his pieces into the center. And this must be over quickly. Okay, and at this point he resigns. I'm not sure why he picked this exact point, but certainly uh, White's winning pretty easily. So the moral of that story was, well, there were two things. One was creating the doubled pawns in the center and then blockading them, not directly. He could have put a, a piece on e5, it just didn't really come up. So he had a piece in front of those pawns on e4, and at any rate an outpost, because it couldn't be attacked by the enemy pawns and simply increase the pressure until something gave, basically, until black just didn't have enough space to do anything and he was stuck defending those central pawns and eventually that central pawn on e6 really hurt him and ended up being the key problem. That concludes our lectures on not only isolated e-pawns and not only isolated e-pawns for black, but isolated pawns in general. So next week we'll start with a new subject and I hope to see you there. This has been Beyond the Opening with John Watson.